Today on Inside California Politics, California reaches a grim milestone in the pandemic. We now have the most confirmed COVID cases in the nation. A sober reminder uh, of why we are taking uh, things as seriously as we are. A sober reminder uh, of why we put in that mask mandate. The latest on the state's response. Plus, as restrictions once again tighten in the Golden State, the list of lawmakers critical of Governor Newsom's decisions grows. It's very nonsensical to a lot of people, including myself, as to what what data they're using to make these decisions. And back to school, back to distance learning. is probably the greatest challenge we will face in our lifetime. What State Superintendent Tony Thurman says has to happen before students are allowed back in the classroom. Also, Republicans need to pull their head out of the sand, get their act together, sit down with Speaker Pelosi and me, and start negotiating a real package. Fighting amongst lawmakers as unemployment benefits are set to expire. A report from Washington on the status of another stimulus package. Today, July 26th, on Inside California Politics. Hi everyone, I'm Mickey Lorenzo and welcome to Inside California Politics. It seems like there is no end in sight as the coronavirus continues to spread across the country. Here in California, we've once again become the center of this crisis with the most total cases in the U.S. So to fight this pandemic, Governor Newsom announced additional protections for essential workers, including healthcare workers, farm workers, cooks, laborers, truck drivers, and cashiers. Newsom said that's where the state is seeing the biggest spread amongst those who have to work right now. That help includes another three $315 million deal with the Chinese manufacturer to buy masks. The state is also expanding its Project Room Key program to include essential workers so that they can self isolate in a hotel room if they do become infected. He is also extending his orders, which provided them paid sick leave. So all of this as school districts up and down the state try to figure out what school will look like this year. We told you the governor announced recently that most of the state's schools will remain closed for the time being. We have State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, joining us here on the show to talk about what distance learning is going to look like in the fall. Superintendent Thurman, thank you so much for being back on Inside California Politics. We appreciate it. Thank you, Nikki. Okay, so the last time we spoke when distance learning first started, we had a discussion about supplies and really reaching those students who are, were gonna start distance learning, maybe didn't have access to Wi-Fi, maybe didn't have access to a tablet. Now that we have these 30 plus counties on a watch list and we're talking about distance learning once again in the fall, what is your office in the state doing to make sure that they can reach out to those students? You know, thanks. You know, it's definitely a, a lot of concern about what school will look like and supplies is a big issue. The good news is, is that all 10,000 of our schools have received personal protective equipment. We're talking about 14 million cloth coverings, uh, 2.4 million face shields. I mean, so much hand sanitizer, thermometers, all the things that will be necessary to support um, the opening of school. The issue is, is when will it be safe for actual in-class instruction? And right now, most of our schools are in counties where we're monitoring high numbers of case transmission. And so for now, most of our schools are gonna open in distance learning, play it safe, and we'll continue to watch and monitor until it's safe to move into in-class instruction. Do you think this pandemic is changing education as we've all known it? I mean, thinking about when many, many years ago when I was in school and, you know, you you bell rang at 8 a.m., you were out at two or three o'clock. Do you think that model is gone? You know, I think many parts of it really are changing before our very eyes. The idea that the computer has become the connector uh, between great teachers and great students is a concept that I don't think I envisioned. You know, we all went into distance learning overnight and everything around us is changing and we're having all these conversations now about how do we still provide quality education to our kids and, and that means doing it through different ways through remote learning but the bottom line is we've got to make sure we do three things no matter what first and foremost keep our kids safe second take care of their social emotional learning needs and counseling if they need it and third yes find a way to provide quality learning no matter what the circumstances because students are always learning and they always deserve to have the opportunity. You're absolutely right. This is gonna force us to think differently about everything. How do we measure learning, right? We've dispensed with, for this year, at least for the school year that passed, we've already dispensed with statewide testing. 
Um, uh, the SAT for admission, as we enter into a new school year, uh, it's likely that that will be the case. So things have definitely changed. Um, we have to lean in to think about how we're going to continue to support our students um, under these very new and challenging circumstances. Challenging indeed, and these are not easy decisions to make. Are you talking with the governor? He seems to make all these announcements in terms of when schools are going to close and counties close, of course. Are you guys working together on this? We do, and we've approached it in different ways. You know, the governor and his office helped to make all that personal protective equipment available, but our office actually coordinated with all the county offices of education, all 58 of them, to help get the, you know, the face coverings and the hand sanitizer to the individual classes. Most schools have it, some are still getting it. Our office put out guidance that really explains how classes might be arranged, small class sizes, what the schedule might look like. The governor and his team, you know, they have access to health experts who've really given us some ways to think about some metrics for when it's safe for a school to be open. Now we know if a school has been on the monitoring list and hasn't been off of that list for 14 days, that's a sign that that school should not be open. And so what we're trying to do is bridge really health and science data with good best practices around instruction and how to arrange our classes to figure this out and to figure this out together as we move forward. What data will you have to see? What information will have to be on your desk for you to feel safe for students to go back in school and not do distance learning? You know, the conditions that we're seeing at this time right now with multiple, you know, more than you know, two dozen counties on the monitoring list because of the number of cases and hospitalizations and the lack of capacity at hospitals, all those things are signs um, that it's not safe to open. We should not take a chance and opening schools under those conditions. And I've always said that we won't open schools unless they're safe. California Department of Education actually manages three great schools in the state. We serve deaf and blind students all across the state. And we've made the decision that those schools will open in distance learning. But what we'll do is we'll continue to monitor that data. And if it looks like things are getting better, the case numbers are going down, we'll look for opportunities to open in really small class sizes so that we can maintain physical distance and of course, everyone coming back with a face covering. And so we'll monitor and then make those moves. The other thing about the face covering is we can control some of what's happening around us. We can make the case numbers go down. We can improve things by washing our hands and wearing a face covering and maintaining physical distance. And so what we do right now is critical. But for now, we open safely and we do that through distance learning. And maybe us adults, we lead by example. We wear our face covering so when the kiddos see us and they got to go back to school, they know they got to have those on too. That's absolutely right. In some countries and in some states, the whole focus is on helping to condition children to wearing a mask, that they understand that it's part of what we have to do now. When we're in the community, we wear a face covering. The other thing is the reason we provided so much uh, you know, personal protective equipment to our schools is because we understand a student's going to forget to bring a mask. Staff will forget to bring a mask. This is not an area where you punish a child. This is an opportunity to teach, and we're teaching safety. We teach health and safety to our students all the time. This is another element that, out of necessity, we have to teach. I look forward to the day when we don't have to teach these elements, but for now, we do. I'm grateful for the resilience of our students, their parents, and our educators. This is hard. We have to acknowledge that. There's no two ways about that, but this is what we need to do to remain safe and to provide an education for our students. It's probably the greatest challenge we will face in our lifetime. But as it relates to providing a great education for our students, California is rising to meet that challenge, and we will meet that challenge together. Perfect note to end it on right there. State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, thank you so much for your time and being back on the show this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Continue to stay safe and well. You as well. In just a matter of hours, the state capitol re will reopen to lawmakers, but not all of them will be returning. Legislative leaders said they will let members at higher risk for COVID-19 vote on or weigh in on pending bills from their districts. A few weeks ago, seven people who work in the state capitol became infected with the virus, including one assemblyman. The assembly plans to let four legislative leaders cast votes for absent members during floor sessions. The Senate will let lawmakers cast votes remotely, but only in committee hearings.
Governor Newsom continues to face criticism over his job performance to do another shutdown here in California, which includes distance learning in the fall. And one of those criticizing the governor is Republican State Senator Melissa Melendez. Senator Melendez, thanks so much for joining us here on Inside California Politics. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Okay, so let's just start right there. What do you think the governor is doing wrong? <laughs> well, um, you know, for starters, what I've been hearing from most of my constituents is the issue relating to schools reopening, which is a huge issue. I can't tell you um, how many people have written to me and called me Democrats, Republicans, you know, you name it, very concerned about what this means for their students and for them as parents for the upcoming school year. Um, I myself, I will have three kids in high school, so we're not really certain how this is going to work with respect to all three kids being on a Zoom conference all day long for their class and you know having enough bandwidth to accommodate that that doesn't even touch on the the students who maybe don't have a device the state has a 700,000 shortage now of devices for students and not to mention maybe the kids you know whose homes don't have Wi-Fi so that's for me that is the biggest concern as a parent is how uh, this is going to work for our kids because they don't get a do-over you know for their education and they're going to be very much behind when for instance my daughter who's a senior in high school this year will be graduating and looking hopefully to go on to college so I think there are a lot Lot of questions about how this is going to work and we are still waiting for answers. So speaking of that, you're a parent, but you're also a state senator. Uh, how how can you be part of the solution? What do you think you can do to try to help ease this situation? Yeah, I think that um, the governor would do well to include legislators in his talks a little more often. You know, we don't get um, any sort of personal um, reach out from the governor as to how we feel about this. In fact, for the, for in large part, the state has been run solely by the governor really since the shutdown. The legislature came back and then we were sent home again and then we came back and then we were sent home again. So really the governor is, is calling all of the shots and I think it would be helpful if legislators were included in these conversations about how better um, or how best to move forward. It's a, it's a difficult situation. I, I, you know, I won't deny that and I certainly give credit where credit is due. And in the beginning, you know, I think people probably recall that the legislature itself gave the governor high marks for making the move that he did um, in, you know, slow it, or I guess flattening the curve for 14 days. But that turned into many, many weeks and we have been shut out of the process. So we would like to engage with the governor um, on how best to move forward. It's not a one size fits all. I think he's um, has acknowledged that in some of the moves that he's made recently, but I still think there needs to be more um, inclusiveness on the part of the governor with respect to uh, legislators weighing in. So I want to talk about Riverside County is in your district. Uh, up until this week, they were the second largest county in, in terms of number of cases. Orange County overtook that number two spot. What do you see as the rise? Why do you think there's a rise there? Why do you think that uh, Riverside County is seeing that spike? That's a good question. I think it's for a number of reasons, but I find it curious. Now, if you look at the statistics, go back to when the governor mandated that everyone wear a mask in public and the numbers didn't go down. I mean, they just didn't. In fact, they increased. So is that because people are refusing to wear the mask? Is that because the masks really aren't helping the spread of the virus? I don't know, but I do know that people are growing very, very restless, particularly because there's no consistency as far as what is closed, what is open, how long will it be? And I think people are getting very frustrated and we're seeing that, um, you know, in some of the gatherings that people are having and just the pushback that the governor is receiving on some of the, the steps that he's taken. It, you know, it's a serious virus, obviously, but I think scaring the public the, the way some have chosen to do, I don't think it's helpful. I think we need to be honest and truthful and look at the data and, and the information coming from the entire medical community as a whole rather than a few select people. So you do not agree with the shutdown of certain businesses that the governor's rolled back? Well, it's interesting because, you know, tell me why I can go to Costco and have been able to since the pandemic started. I can go to Costco whenever I choose and there are several people there at the grocery store, a grocery store that my daughter works at and she can go work at a grocery store, but she can't go to school. Um, or you can go to Target or you can go to Walmart, you can go, you know, a number of places, but you can't go into a hair salon or a nail salon or a restaurant at 
operating at 50% capacity or a bar or, I mean, it's just, it's very nonsensical to a lot of people, including myself, as to what what data they're using to make these decisions. Even as far as, um, you know, I was looking at the website yesterday for what constitutes a meal. The administration, ABC in particular, has decided what constitutes a meal for a takeout type of establishments where they can serve alcohol as well. And it's ludicrous. I mean, they're saying things that would be considered an appetizer. Well, you can't consider that a meal, so therefore you can't have an alcoholic beverage to go along with that. I mean, it just, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know who's making these decisions decisions, but um, I think they need to perhaps take another look at it. Maybe talk to actual, you know, Californians who are out there visiting these establishments to ask what they think, because none of us can make any sense of it. California State Senator Melissa Melendez, thank you so much for your time and being on Inside California Politics this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Negotiations in Washington continue over the next coronavirus relief bill, and unless an agreement is reached, that extra federal unemployment money will disappear for millions of people. A full report from Washington is next. Congress is expected to pass another round of stimulus funding, but there is some gridlock among the Republicans. So to talk about that and more, we have Fox 40's Joe Khalil joining us now from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Joe, great to see your face this morning. Welcome to Inside California Politics. Thank you. I'm excited. All right, so take us through what's happening on Capitol Hill because there's been some negotiations. Of course, Democrats passed the HEROES Act a couple of months ago. That has pretty much been dead in the Senate. But this week, it seems like the negotiations on the Republican side on a coronavirus relief package, they have started. Yeah, really in earnest for the first time. Uh, as you mentioned, the HEROES Act has been sitting there, and Democrats have continued to say that's where we are. We're not budging from what we passed already in the HEROES Act. So, you know, what we're seeing from the Republican side now is a couple of proposals, a couple of ideas that uh, have been brought forth. The, the only concrete numbers that uh, we have seen so far would be $26 billion for testing, 25 or 26, uh, depending on who you ask, and then about $100 billion uh, for school funding. Now, they do want to do the those direct checks to, to families. But I got to tell you, other than that, we don't really have a lot of concrete proposals uh, from the Republican Party. There's a lot of division about how much this package itself should cost. Uh, the, the number that we've heard is $1 trillion. But even that, a lot of members, you know, particularly those Tea Party members, Senators Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, and the like, they have said $1 trillion is way too much. Uh, the Democrat package, by the way, the HEROES Act, is $3 trillion. But on the Republican side, you got some disagreement about uh, how much to put into it and about what their priorities should be. I did get a chance to talk to the House GOP leader, Kevin McCarthy, uh, and he told me essentially he doesn't mind the Republican gridlock so long as it leads to a better bill. He said, you know, look, these are really, really important issues, and if we have to resolve it, if we got to go back to the drawing table and make sure that we have a bill that we like, uh, he's, he says it's worth the delay. But, you know, on the other side of the aisle, we had Senator Schumer today say, Every day that we delay this, more people could die as a result of inaction. So you have that gridlock right now. I don't expect to see anything concrete in terms of both parties coming together with a package, uh, at least for a couple of weeks. You actually had a back and forth, too, with Speaker Pelosi, and it doesn't sound like there's going to be any budging when it comes to the HEROES Act. No negotiation there, right? Yeah, you know, one of the uh, reasons that we're starting to feel this sort of deadline is because at the end of July, uh, that's when that unemployment bonus, that $600 a week, runs out. And so a lot of Americans are relying on that. So I did ask Speaker Pelosi, that was the number you had in the HEROES Act. Uh, Republicans have come back and said $600 a week is way too much money for unemployment. A lot of people are making more money by staying home than they were ever working. So uh, Republicans have floated $100 a week as opposed to $600. And I asked Speaker Pelosi, look, now that we're getting into the negotiation phase, uh, are you going to budge at all on that $600? She said, absolutely not. And she also said, uh, that's not going to be a thing that they do separately. You know, a lot of people were wondering if there's gridlock and you can't get a big, massive $3 trillion stimulus package, maybe what you can do is separate that unemployment benefit and just legislate that on its own as a standalone bill. She said no to that, too. She said, it's going to be part of this big package. If we're going to help people who are unemployed right now. We're going to help everybody. Uh, and so she wants it to be a big package. And it seems right now as though Democrats, even though we haven't gotten into the negotiation phase yet between the two parties, it seems like they're going to be pretty rigid about what's already in the HEROES Act and they're not moving very much. 
Well, on that note, we'll leave it there. I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. Fox 40's Joe Khalil joining us live from Washington, D.C. Joe, great to see you and talk to you. Thanks so much. All right, Nikki, good to be with you again. Thank you. A big announcement from President Trump last week. He is canceling the portion of the Republican National Convention that was to be held in Jacksonville, Florida. The sheriff there in Jacksonville recently said there were just not enough officers, time or money to keep everyone safe during the convention. GOP events in North Carolina, those are still in the works. And speaking of the election, we want to focus on California's 23rd congressional district. So you may know this as House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy's district, but a woman named Kim Mangon is hoping to change that as she runs against him. So I I recently spoke with her about her campaign and what it's like to run against one of the most powerful Republicans in Washington. When I see how our representative is not representing the people, um, he's not looking for our uh, for our best interests. And his voting record shows over and over again that he does not, then something has to be done. And uh, after that, I decided watching his voting record and de determining that he did not care about the people, I said I had to run. He has to go. Okay, let's talk about your district a little bit because it is deep red. There are more registered Republicans than there are Democrats. So either you're going to have to get more Democrats to turn out than Republicans, or you're going to have to get Republicans to vote for you. How are you going to do that? Um, my message, my message is very plain, is that I am I'm going to go support you. Joe Biden's plan, I think, that he just put out, that focuses on uh, creating jobs for people, focusing on climate change, uh, rolling everything into one to really help the people. That is, that it was, I was just thrilled when I saw that because that's what my vision is, is, w is to go to Washington and, uh, and enact all those. But it's mainly just getting the message out to the people. I've had Republicans, Democrats, independents all come to me and say, uh, of course, before we started the shutdowns, but come to me and say that they were tired of the status quo and tired of not having somebody that represented them, you know, that tried to get rid of health care uh, for 20 million Americans, um, you know, voted against a prescription drug bill. It's just issue after issue that he shows that he does not care about the people. If you go to Washington, if you were elected by the people in your district, when we see work, and I, I want to say work in, in quotes because not a lot happens, and that's on both sides of the aisle, there, it, there needs to be compromise, and there's not a lot of that happening right now. Are you willing to work with Republicans? You know, because what we see a lot is Democrats are in their corner, Republicans are in their corner, and it's just gridlock right now. Well, my history actually makes it very easy to uh, work with people that agree with me or don't agree with me. Um, you know, I was... Uh, uh, aircraft mechanic when it was not popular to be a, a female aircraft mechanic. I was a systems engineer in a male dominated field, which means I'm used to working with people who are not necessarily on the same page as I am. And I, so I know how to compromise. I know how to reach decisions and when to compromise and when not to compromise. He's been the go-to doctor on COVID-19, but last week, Dr. Anthony Fauci got to have some fun. Up next, a little perspective on his life and career. Stay with us. All right, you know him by now. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, a key voice during the pandemic, serving on the president's coronavirus task force. And in case you aren't familiar with his background, here you go. In 1984, he became the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, a position he still holds to this day. He's advised six presidents, starting with Ronald Reagan, was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George W. Bush. Dr. Fauci is 79 years old. He'll turn 80 this year on Christmas Eve. He still exercises daily and a recent interview, Dr. Fauci told Yahoo News he puts in a 19 hour workday because of the pandemic and still manages to fit in a three and a half mile run each day. So after all that, you may be wondering, is this guy right here? Is he human? Well, as we say in TV, roll the video. Sands. Oh. Just a bit outside, a little major league quote for you today. Uh, that was Dr. Fauci throwing the first pitch at the Nationals Yankees game as we welcome back America's pastime this week. So Fauci's wild pitch proves, yes, he is human. Also makes me think of a quote from the great Yogi Berra. Quote, in baseball, 
You don't know nothing. So I think we can cut the doctor some slack on this one, though. He's been just a little bit busy trying to fight a pandemic. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Nikki Lorenzo, and we'll see you next Sunday right here on Inside California Politics.